Hey everyone, we are rapidly approaching October and you know what that means. This time of year, every year, I go back to my favorite horror movies, my favorite thriller movies, my favorite science fiction horror movies, any type of movie that really falls into the autumn, fall vibes. I love this time of year. And I had originally, as a child, wanted to be a science fiction horror special effects artist, and eventually that turned into just wanting to make my own movies. But today, we are visiting one of my all-time favorite movies, and that is John Carpenter's The Thing. Anyone messes with me and the whole camp goes. Come on, child, burn me. Put those torches on the floor and back off. What can you really say about this movie? John Carpenter in the mid 70s through the 80s and even some jams in the 90s, but that decade from the mid 70s through the 80s, he was at his peak, he was untouchable. This type of John Carpenter is one of the greatest inspirations for me. I've got one that can see. You wanna see him sprayed all over that map, baby? Where's the president? John Carpenter is one of my favorite directors. The man is no nonsense. He knows who he is. He knows what he can deliver. And I think sometimes he doesn't even realize how good of a director he truly was and what he has contributed to our pop culture and to the culture of filmmaking in general, whether it was his iconic synth scores that he recorded himself, whether it was just his iconic shots, the way he told stories, the way he developed his characters. Peak John Carpenter is cream of the crop. That's like pouring perfume on a pig. He has just a specific way of telling stories through his eye that you only can say that is a John Carpenter movie. But today, we are going to focus on The Thing. Hey, look, Childs, come on. When the lights went out. That would have been a perfect time. Right. You said guys were missing. And Withers, where were you? In Palm Road. Where were you? Where were you? The Thing is a remake. Uh, the original film was black and white way back in the day. Good movie, but it was basically just the thing from outer space uh, about a big creature who's uh, thawed out uh, in a block of ice, thought to be an alien. The needle's at the top. And he wreaks havoc on the Antarctic uh, encampment where these scientists are, which the location itself delivers an amazing jump start for these movies. But I will say, out of both of these films, John Carpenter's is far superior. It really is a mystery. It's a, it's almost a, I would say, it's not a murder mystery because you're dealing with a ravenous, horrific alien that can take the form of anything, any life form that it touches or that it consumes. So you have this horror element to this movie uh, with all the uh, special effects, which we'll get into, with all the gore, with all the, you know, the, the alien aspects. Um, but you also have this mystery because as the film progresses, this alien takes on the form of different scientists and different people who are working at this camp, and you really never know who's who, who's what, and the sense of paranoia that's developed from the beginning of this film all the way throughout towards the end is masterful. Who's got access to it? I guess I'm the only one. And I got the only key. Test of work, Doc? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Somebody else sure helped us, huh? Well, who else could have used that key? Nobody. I just give it to Copper whenever he needs it. Could anybody have gotten it from you, Doc? I don't see how. As soon as I'm finished, I return it right away. The cast is incredible. You have Kurt Russell, you have Wilford Brimley, you have Keith David, Donald Moffat. The list goes on and on. These are all iconic, memorable characters. This movie's highly quotable. I grew up quoting this movie left and right to my friends. Everybody knew it. I don't know what the hell's in there. 
It's weird and pissed off, whatever it is. Bennings, go get Childs. Also, let's not forget, when this movie came out, it came out around the same time as E.T. So you had the juxtaposition of this, you know, family, uh, you know, emotional, masterful film in E.T., but on the other side of it, you have this horror uh, alien. So I think the timing wasn't necessarily good for the thing because E.T. just took the world by storm. But over time, this film has revealed itself to be the masterpiece that it is. And its longevity is timeless. I mean, I watch this movie every year. Everybody talks about this movie as being one of their favorites. It's just an iconic film. Clear. Clear. <laughs> So you have Kurt Russell, who's basically the helicopter pilot um, protagonist of this film. They set him up to be the badass. He's the guy who kind of makes the decisions. But you also have the other characters and the scientists. They have all their nicknames, Windows, Giles, Fuchs. And these names kind of just become embedded in us as the movie goes along. And the characters are so well written, so well shot, that they all feel very realistic. Nalls, will you turn that crap down? I'm trying to get some sleep. I was shot today. Very we wanna, we do. Right on the wall. Um, they're at an outpost in Antarctica, so the isolation effect is there. You have their dynamics. It's almost, I wouldn't say it's a family. They're, they're friends, you know, but they're also colleagues. They're just, they're here and they're getting through it to, you know, whenever they leave or whatever happens. Awesome opening credit sequence with the effects, kind of a throwback to the original movie. What's also ironic about this movie is usually John Carpenter scores a lot of his movies. I think there may be moments in this film where he adds an effect, a synth thing, because that's just what he does. But Ennio Morricone is really the one who scored this movie with that iconic boom boom. And just the dread sets in. And there's just so many iconic moments in this movie, you know, whether it's the opening sequence with the helicopter chasing the dog and the man trying to kill it. And so they kill him, bring the dog in, send it in with their pack. And, you know, obviously all hell breaks loose after that. They go explore the other camp and see what's going on over there. They discover the, 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 the weird bodies, the morphing, the frozen blood, what went on here. They bring the stuff back. They look at their video of them measuring a UFO. So then they go explore where that site was. They come across the spaceship. So now we're really getting into the science fiction element of this movie. And these men now realize that it's not just a normal situation that they're dealing with. They could be coming across the greatest discovery for man, but they can't reach anybody. The storms, it's winter. It's just not a good time for this to be happening. It's really not a good time for this to ever be happening because it's just a horrific alien. But, you know, it's the thing. So slowly things just start happening. You have the iconic scene with the dogs and the kennel and the, the special effects. I mean, it's really hard to watch because it's gory as anything, but you can't pull your eyes away from the screen because it's just so memorable and it's so well executed. Who needs CGI when you watch the thing? It's so well done. And these, these creators, they were so original. It was probably so fun to come up with, you know, how things were going to morph, how arms were going to fall off, how chests were going to open up without having to just go to a computer screen and doing it. And when you're watching it, you see it on the screen. You know it's there. You're not in the back of your mind saying, oh, that's a computer effect. <laughs> love the blowtorch, the sound, the effects. It was a hard scene because I do love dogs, so that scene is kind of always a little bit of a oof. But, you know, it's early and you move forward. Um, so now you have this alien loose. They're all starting to freak out. You have... Um, Blair 
uh, played by Wilford Brimley, who's amazing. I, I love that actor from Cocoon to his older movies. He's just phenomenal. And if you watch the director's commentary of this movie, they're always referencing him, Kurt Russell, uh, talking about that. He's starting to get a little curious. He does some calculations, and he realizes that this alien could infect the world. What's going on here? After all their deductions up at this point from the other camp, from their investigation, what happened with the dogs, what's going on here, he's coming to the conclusion that this is not good. So Blair starts losing his mind. We know where that goes. But throughout all this, you have the paranoia. You have John Carpenter's awesome direction. Before the whole kennel fiasco, there's a shot of this dog walking down the hallway. And it's just the tone, the way he sets it up, the interactions between the characters. You know, you have the, the pothead guy talking about chariots of the gods and the aliens. This film came out in 1982, so a lot of these uh, conspiracies or, uh, you know, interest in the aliens was so much more captivating because we didn't have the internet. It wasn't everywhere, so it was always this taboo subject or this fringe subject. And it was just fascinating the way that John Carpenter and the writers kind of tied in chariots of the gods, which is a real book to the actual lore of the thing, you know, even though the Chariots of the Gods is more of, you know, who created the Earth, where the thing is just, wow, this, this crash landed on our planet and it's gonna wreak havoc, whatever it comes across. So that being said, uh, Blair does his calculations, he kind of loses his mind at some point, you know, he starts shooting and destroying everything, wants to kill everybody because he knows this thing cannot escape. They think he's going nuts, they lock him up outside, and then they continue figuring out what to do and how to survive and how to capture this alien or kill this alien and get through whatever they have to get through. And at this point, if you're watching this movie for the first time, you really don't know who's who, who's the alien, who's lying, who is, you know, just paranoid. So, you know, you have to put your mind in the mind of these guys, you know, what would you do? There's nowhere to go. You're at an outpost in Antarctica. You have this mysterious alien that's obviously wreaked havoc on another campground and now it's infesting yours. It's very scary. And John Carpenter has such a good way of telling simple stories, but in an elevated way. He just kind of, and as he's described this way himself, and I forget what interview it was, but he said something along the lines of, He's able to just lay the carpet between the rooms, go from next scene to the next scene. The pacing's well, the lines are good, the directing is top notch. You're never held too long in one scene. It kind of moves perfectly, and he's got a brilliant eye when it comes to horror. And there's certain moments in this film that just are burned into my memory. It isn't Benick! changing and he's, he lets out that scream I mean that is amazing horror in the way that's done and it's simple it's just the sounds the tone the music the location it all just comes into a perfect storm and that scene embodies it you have the scene where they're all lined up and they're doing the blood test and uh, Kurt Russell's you know testing their blood with with the heat and they realize that it, you know if you use if you attack the thing it's gonna respond so they start burning the blood and whoever's blood reacts you know that person is the thing and they're going through everybody the tensions building up and then finally at the end when you think it's over the one last guy he hits it and he freaks out and he's jumping and the one guy's tied to the chair <laughs> just bouncing up and down and just the effects the blood the face every every time the thing presents itself in this movie it's a different effect completely different embodiment of it and that's the brilliance of it it's super bloody it's super gory and I'm not usually a huge gore fan personally I think sometimes it's a cop-out for the fear but not for John Carpenter this was necessary for this movie and it was brilliant and you also have amazing funny lines you know specifically to that scene when uh, Donald Moffat says I know you gentlemen have been through a lot. And when you find the time, I'd rather not spend the rest of this winter tied to this fucking couch! Or the interactions between Blair and, uh, you know, McCready, Kurt Russell, later on when they're at the door and they're interacting. Or when McReady and I think someone else goes down, when McReady and another character go down into the tunnel where Blair was, you know, digging and he created a UFO. And they say, Blair's been busy. Very quotable movie. 
very different characters, very well done. One other thing, I think it rips through your clothes when it takes you over. Windows found some shredded long johns, but the name tag was missing. They could be anybody's. I think they shot this film in the Arctic Circle. And I'm always a stickler for having to shoot at location. That's impossible. You're not going to go to Antarctica. You're not gonna, you do work with what you have. But they did shoot on location. And again, wasn't a green screen. It's not like the remake that came out years later with Mary Elizabeth Winstead when they were trying to do the prequel of the Norwegian camp and show you what happened and it was all computer, blah, blah, blah. Just a rehash. That John Carpenter's magic was nowhere near. And there's never a moment in this movie where you're bored, where you're wondering, you know, all right, when is this going to end? Like I said, John Carpenter paces his movies brilliantly. He makes everything interesting. He's a very talented director. And in my opinion, one of the best. Even outside of horror, he's one of the best. He does have his flops, don't get me wrong, but who doesn't? Another iconic scene is when Dr. Cooper, who I thought was interesting, I think he has a nose ring, and I always thought that was an interesting touch. Don't know why, but again, you're adding layers to these characters, like the guy who's roller skating all the time. Another, the chef, he's an amazing character as well. They all have their little complexities, as in little character additions that just separate them from each other, and it's not just a cast that's forgettable. But another iconic scene is when the character Norris uh, begins to have a heart attack, and they show that earlier when he's holding his chest, and. You know, they're really all paranoid at this point. But uh, he starts literally having a heart attack, and Dr. Cooper decides, oh, man, we got to give him a chest. And they're, you know, pumping him, pumping him. And then he goes to pump him again. And then his chest just opens up into a giant mouth with teeth, and they cut his arms off. Brutal. And that scene just rolls out of itself and, you know, turns into chaos. And that's when we get the iconic, you know, the head melts off the body, the head sprouts spider legs and starts crawling away. And we get another iconic line right there. Gotta be fucking kidding. Nah, no, just can't beat it. This movie is highly rewatchable. So like I said, I'm not gonna really get into the plot and drag on, we've all seen it, but I just wanted to touch on the notes a little bit and touch on what makes this movie so great and why it's one of my favorites. Even the artwork of the poster's phenomenal. I mean, you got that snowsuit with the light blasting out. I remember walking through Blockbuster and seeing that and be like, what is this? I wanna watch this movie, The Thing. Little moments in this movie, like when they go into the blood room and uh, I think it's Bennings is getting wrapped around by The Thing and the blood and he's getting sucked into like this closet. Very creepy. Uh, you know, this, I can list on and on and on how many scenes creeped me out in this movie because the whole movie itself is creepy. Even the monster at the end when the thing reveals itself in its true form. It's done really well. I mean, when I was little, I, I wouldn't say I was disappointed because I did like the moments where the thing would flash in the dark, come out, you don't know where it is. So when it revealed itself, you're kind of like, ah, it's the end of the movie, which is fine because we were at the end of the movie. Badass moment for Kurt Russell, another great quote. Fuck you too. The claymation when it first popped out of the hole and pulls itself up and then you cut to the practical effects and you see all the things it had turned into and he just blows the whole thing up. You know, not drawn out, perfect. And before it reveals itself in that scene, you have the three characters left, which were Nollis the cook, uh, McReady, and Donald Moffat's character of Gary. And they're setting all the charges or whatever, and then Gary goes off to do something, uh, Donald Moffat, and he turns, and then you see Blair just walks out, and it's a great John Carpenter type uh, synth hit at that point. And he sticks his hand in his mouth, but it's like not in his mouth, it's in his cheeks, and it's just another... Uh, iconic John Carpenter type moment when it comes to horror you know like the guy in any other movie he just would have been like ah, I'm gonna strangle you or I'm just gonna break your jaw off no it was like this weird hand in the mouth and the shaking and the way it just the, I, the look on Wilford Brimley's face who at that point was the thing
just so well done, you know, and then Kurt Russell's left alone, he hears the dark and all those boxes pop up and roll out at him. I love Keith David in this movie. You know, he was great in They Live. He's been in so many movies that we've seen throughout our years. I think he's phenomenal in this. Uh, you know, him and McReady at the end sitting there. You know, you don't know who's who, and they're kind of just, you know, not giving up. Well, kind of giving up, but almost just taking a break and, you know, seeing how the night's going to go. And, you know, what a note to end the movie on. Not the only one. Um, interesting that those two, especially Keith David, are, is the one to survive, you know? And that's what's cool about this movie, too. You don't really know who's going to survive. Usually you're like, oh, that guy. And I mean, I guess you could say that about Kurt Russell, but it worked because he was presented as the most capable, I think, of the bunch who has the most fortitude. Won't last long, though. Neither will we. How will we make it? Maybe we should. The cinematography is classic John Carpenter, executed by an awesome Dean Cundey. Your deep blues, your harsh shadows, uh, just the ambiance he delivers. I, I always think of the iconic image of McReady, Kurt Russell, in the cold room, uh, waiting for them to come in. He's got the blowtorch, or, or he's going to blow something up, whatever it is. But just the iconic look, uh, matched with the synth beats, and obviously, uh, the fantastic score of this movie. All right, take whatever the hell you are. Looking back on this movie from the end, back to when you first started watching it, there's not a moment that drags. I touched on this before. It never gets boring. It's perfectly paced. It's so well done and so well executed. And as absurd, not in a bad way, and as absurd as the effects were in this movie, as absurd as the moments were, whether it was heads turning into spiders, heads turning into just red mush that eat you, uh, bouncing off of the ceiling, someone in their mouth bouncing around, whether it's arms getting lopped off by chest teeth, dogs pulling apart, heads peeling back, whatever it is, never once do you say, ah, that's too much, ah, that's, that's cheesy. It all works. <laughs> because it's John Carpenter, it's a great special effects team, it's the perfect storm of talent who know how to put forth a fantastic movie, a fantastic science fiction horror movie. And one thing about John Carpenter's direction when it comes to shot selection, he's never overly fancy. You never like, wow, that's a John Carpenter shot, but they're still amazing shots. Uh, he has a lot of static shots, but he uses motion in them when it's necessary, like the dog coming down the hallway, uh, frantic shots chasing McReady down the hallway as the alarms are going off, or it's just, you know, a still shot from out of a window when someone sees someone running. There's always a mystery to it, and you see that in Halloween, you see that in Christine, you see that in a lot of his films. Just his, 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 his direction and his shots are almost muted because the story comes first, but when you actually break down the shots themselves, you're like, wow, that's, that's a really good choice. But they never take precedent over the film itself, and that's a sign of a great director. Steven Spielberg had the same talent, still has the same talent, more or less, where the shots are amazing and they work perfectly for where they're placed, but you don't think about the shots because you're just in the story. Another uh, example of John Carpenter's genius. It's an action movie, it's a horror movie, it's a mystery movie, it's a thriller. This is one of those movies that will be iconic for generations to come and has longevity like movies today really don't anymore. It's a rare find, so go check it out. Well, what do we do? Why don't we just wait here for a little while? See what happens. Thank <laughs> you.